This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend, Professor Marcus Brunnermeyer, who is at Princeton University, and he's also the director of the Bendheim Center at Princeton University, which has been a very, very vital, how do you say, contributor to the debate on new economic thinking over the 12 or 13 years that we've been involved in uh, trying to excavate new economic thinking. And Marcus has really been uh, at the cutting edge. Marcus is here today because he has a new book. It's called The Resilient Society. It's by Endeavor Publishers. It came out just recently. And Marcus is uh, exploring lots of things that I think you will find to be very germane to the challenges before us. Marcus, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Rob. It's a pleasure to be with you and with INET. Let me ask you just quickly to start. What motivated you? What, when, you when you sat down to do this book, what was going on inside your mind that, that brought this to the fore? So I was thinking about resilience quite a while because I you know, worked a lot on systemic risk measures and tried to capture you know, systemic risk. And then there was the COVID crisis. And during the COVID crisis, I organized this webinar series and I tried to distill the main insights from the webinar series and put it under a common theme, some common thread of resilience. So that's the idea of the book, to have a common theme, combining a lot of insights, which I got from many, many speakers. And yeah, so, so that, that so, uh, which Max so called stimulus, stimulus from, from your excellent, excellent webinar series, series, which I attended many, many times over the course of the crisis, uh, gave you, how do I say, a nudge to try to distill, bring forward the insights or crystallize them into a framework. And uh, I noticed at the outset of the book, there's a very important subtlety about words like, or phrases, I should say, risk avoidance, robustness, and resilience. Why don't we start there and tell us what, what, do you, what is the difference? What's the nuance that yeah, in order opens to this? Yeah, in order to figure out what something is, it's probably good to say what it is not or what is it different mm -hmm. from, as you said. And so I, I contrast it, I call it resilience and its cousins. And uh, so robustness is, is a different concept than resilience. And uh, what I often use is this um, story by the French poet in 17th century who compared robustness as with the oak and uh, so it's very robust against winds, and it stands very, very uh, forcefully there and doesn't move at all. And resilience is more like uh, a reed, which is you know constantly swinging back and forth as the wind blows. But there's a big difference between the oak and the reed. If the wind becomes very, very strong, the oak falls over and then can't get back up, while the reed is constantly needs to be very volatile all the time but it always comes back so it's much more resilient yeah, so robustness yeah. has a robustness barrier once you break the robustness barrier you can't come back while well, resilience is all about coming back and the french poet la fontaine 17th century in the poem the reed talks to the uh, to the oak and says i bow and i bend but i don't break and I think that's the mm. principle of resilience uh, in contrast to uh, robustness. And it's related to what I worked early on on the volatility paradox. So it seems something which is very volatile might not be the most robust thing. It might not, not most uh, because it might break. It might break the robustness barrier. And something which constantly moves and is agile and is changing to the circumstances seems at the end of the day much more uh, resilient and it's a, a better way to arrange society to have a more stable society. Yeah, uh, to, forgive me to use an analogy from my engineering training at MIT, but they used to talk about the elastic limit of materials. Mm. You can stress yeah. something and it'll spring back, but if you yes. go beyond the elastic limit, it breaks and is deformed That's permanently. Very nice, yes. <laughs> and uh, but we're now talking about social process. Now, what, how does risk avoidance? relate to resilience? So risk avoidance means you just avoid risks in the first place. You don't go into mm. risky environments. And while you should actually take certain risks, if you know you can bounce back from it, in particular, if you take on this risk and you have a higher growth path, 
So for example, if you compare, you know, different countries like Thailand in the 1990s and India, or so Thailand was growing much more quickly, but was also going for more risky strategy. And then the Southeast Asia crisis was suffering more, but, you know, it came also back, but the income to per capita income ratio is higher. Uh, now, and so it's, it's, you have to think about Schumpeterian growth and other things. It might be more risky. You go for R&D risks and other things. But as long as you can bounce back, it's actually okay. And that's what one has to focus on. One has to really distinguish risks from which you can bounce back if you're agile and adjust, and other risks from which you get trapped and you can't bounce back. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, you know, the distinction between different types of risks is uh, the key to understand. Yes. And in a presentation that I saw in preparing for this, you talked about three levels of resilience, the individual, the systemic and the societal. Help us with those. uh, Yeah, so um, it is indeed the case that you can think of individual resilience, which is very important too. And psychology has done worked a lot and has given us a lot of hints about that uh, and that's you know what is what I said is bouncing back as an individual but then we have also networks and systems which can bounce back and uh, that's you know one way to make something more resilient like global value chains and they can bounce back but I think the book really focus on the resilience of a society and that brings people into the picture and the interaction, in particular, interaction of people. And that's what you have to keep in mind that once you're hit by a shock, you might react in a way which then causes an externality to somebody else. And then the somebody else is then reacting because of the shock which you caused to him. And it feeds back to you and you have some feedback loops and makes the situation even worse. So if you understand this, how this whole thing amplifies and then it leads to these feedback effects, that's very, very important in particular when people interact. And that's when then the social contract comes in and a good social contract essentially tries to mitigate these feedback loops, which are a combination of externalities. And if I may use some economic language, some strategic complementarity. So that's what I call these mm-hmm. feedback externalities. So normal externality is already bad, but if they're combined with the strategic complementarities and develop these feedback externalities, then they're really dangerous because it's not only that I cause a negative externality on somebody else, the reaction of the other will cause it back and then we both get, end up in a spiral and that makes the situation really worse. Yeah, I've heard uh, a number of climate scholars like Jim Boyce and Robert Pollan talking about how the fear, say in a place like West Virginia, that there won't be a social contract for adjustment assistance creates a resistance to addressing climate change, which then, which you might call postpones embracing the challenge until it's a much deeper, more dangerous challenge. And so they're afraid that the social contract does not, how do I say, facilitate the dynamics that we had. And as a guy who grew up in Detroit, I saw globalization. And we're all taught, make everybody better off and nobody worse off. Except without the adjustment assistance, a whole lot of people got trampled. And now the people in West Virginia say, you're going to do to me what you did to the auto industry? Yes. A different kind of shock, climate as opposed to globalization. But people need to believe there's a common good in that social design, I would think, in order to, what you might call, demobilize their resistance to essential change. I agree. And if you have this, then you might be much more open to change, which might be welfare enhancing to everybody. And there are two types of externalities, uh, essentially, the social contract should mitigate. One is externalities from each other. You know, we cause some negative externalities on each other. And then there is some form of insurance against what I call externalities from Mother Nature. So if you suffer a shock, and if it's an idiosyncratic shock, we can partially insure each other. Uh, and that's actually also should be part of the social contract. So these both combinations, that's you know what characterizes a, a stable uh, social contract. And there is the society itself or the social contract should be resilient. That's the key uh, to figure out. Yes, but you can see these. You know, for instance, if I am unmindful, 
of how the people in West Virginia are being treated in adjustment assistance, they become resistant and I experience a negative externality that climate change becomes more dangerous for me and my family. That's correct. And uh, so that we, you really have to have a much more systemic, holistic vision. And uh, I liked how you broke it from you know, individual all the way up to system and societal. Uh, it was very, very, uh, I say, it's very challenging because many of these experiences we're having right now have to do with what I'll call the prevalence of widespread externalities. Yes. The whole question of masks in the pandemic, I would guess, is something that... It's uh, exactly the, the same floor. thing. Uh, if you think about hoarding behavior, it's exactly the same thing. We're all buying toilet paper or whatever it is in the crisis. Uh, if, if the others buy toilet paper, my best response is to also buy more toilet paper. And then we actually end up nobody has any essentials anymore because everybody is hoarding things. And that's actually a mm -hmm. society should be designed in such a way that such behavior, that's just, you know... A trivial example is not behaving this way because we all care about each other and have the institutions in place and incentives in place that even if people behave badly, they don't have the incentives to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked in your uh, presentation that I watched uh, about points of no return. Yes. That there, and what, explain that notion. Yeah, so, so I talk about the resilience destroyers, and we talked about these feedback loops. Uh, that's one resilience destroyer. Another resilience destroyer are these traps. So you, you might be caught in a trap. So if you have a negative shock, you might not go back, come back out. So that's, you have to really watch out for these type of traps. But a very important aspect are these tipping points. It's a third form of uh, resilience destroyer. It's, it's related to um, the feedback loops. Essentially, you might be walking towards a tipping point, and then if you cross the tipping point, you can't come back anymore. And even mm -hmm. worse, it's worse than a trap. A trap you just caught there, but if you have a tipping point, you might just, at that point, it might become worse and worse, and you can't do anything against it anymore. And that's, you know, what you really have to avoid. And you see this a lot in the environmental dimension as well, because you mentioned environment. So if you think about the Gulf Stream stopping, once the Gulf Stream stops, you cannot start it again very easily. Mm -hmm. So there's a mm -hmm. tipping point. So in a sense, there are certain risks where there is no resilience at all. There's anti-resilience. You know, things get even worse. And these risks you should really avoid. Uh, so you really have to classify your risks ex ante, whether you can actually bounce back from them by being agile and adapt to the situation, and others where you can't, even if you're very agile and adapt to it. And that's from an ex ante perspective, it's very, very important to draw the distinction across the various forms of risks. So if I'm looking at a graph, a transient disturbance, you go down and you come back up that's to correct, the yes. baseline, the tipping point, you go down, and you trip across the boundary and you keep going down, down yes. and the displacement becomes the new base. Yes. And uh, oh, that's very, that's very I, interesting. I should perhaps also say coming back doesn't mean necessarily you come back to the old point. There might be mm -hmm. a new normal and the new normal mm -hmm. might actually be better than the previous normal. So if I, if I look at the, the COVID crisis in particular, you know, we might come back to a world where we have way better vaccines. We will know how to produce vaccines within a few months. We might be now be able with these new technologies to create malaria vaccines and, you know, treat cancer differently. So there is, yeah. or we change working from home, the whole, you know, we were locked in, in some certain behavior and a certain shock can also sh sh shake us and bring us to new opportunities. And that's, part of it too so it doesn't need to go back to the old normal it can go to a new normal as well and mm -hmm. hopefully it's well, a better normal for instance you you modernize ventilation systems you modernize sewage systems in communities and let's say the covid covid challenges behind us but the how would I, susceptibility to illness in communities is diminished in a non-transient way by that threshold change in the systems yes yeah, so and so what comes exactly, so what you also don't want, if I may say so, is that you don't want to protect humans from any shocks. So it's a little bit like, you know, if you don't expose your kids to any risks at all, they never grow up. 
So they have to have yeah. some setbacks, yeah. and this way they know how to handle bigger shocks later on when they're adults. Or mm -hmm. if you think about the human immune system, it's also designed, you know, if you make your kids or anybody live in a very sterile environment, you will be knocked off by any little shock later on. But if you're exposed to some bacteria and in a small dose and know how to handle it, you will also be able to handle it differently. So one another message mm -hmm. of the book is you might want to expose you know, society to some smaller shocks. At least don't kick the can down the road in order to avoid a small shock, knowing that actually it will become a much bigger one later on and we will not be able, not trained to handle the bigger shock. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very characteristic in the COVID crisis that um, you know, the, the countries which had the experience with SARS, they were initially way better in handling uh, the yes. COVID outbreak. And so it was, in a sense, a good, I mean, I shouldn't say a good thing, but it, it had some positive effects uh, mm -hmm. from that. And the same thing is true if you look at the reaction of the central banks and the fiscal and the government, the fiscal authorities, during the COVID crisis was way more aggressive compared to the global financial crisis. But, you know, the central banks have learned how to react to, mm -hmm. to the globe from the global financial crisis. And they can just replay the same playbook they have learned from the global financial crisis. And this way bounce back much quicker this time around. Yeah. So, so in this sense, learning from smaller crises is actually a good thing. So it's a little bit like the read. You constantly, when there's winds coming, you try to learn and adapt. And um, and this way, when a bigger storm is coming, you're also ready to handle it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I kind of sense myself right now that, like you mentioned, the learning of the great financial crisis. When you look at macro policy now, we have all these games going on in the pharmaceutical industry about dissemination. And then you see the variants, the mutant variants coming back. And the cost of subsidizing pharma companies to get on their horse is in the billions of dollars, the cost of further shutdowns and delays in the trillions of dollars. Yes. And it feels like we have a collective action problem and what you might call scorekeeping on the balance sheets of companies where we've got to unlock things and be much more, particularly in the global south, pervasive in dissemination of vaccines. because. We all, and, I, and I think we are learning that yes, I think we are slower than it. we'd hoped. Uh, I think the, the biggest challenge is actually distribution of the vaccines, I think. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, just uh, production is a huge challenge in the distribution across the countries, but within the country to convince the population in many, many countries to get vaccinated will be the way biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And this cannot be orchestrated from outside. It has to be done within the country. And that mm -hmm. will be by far the biggest challenge. You see it in, even in the advanced countries that there's a lot of resistance to take the drugs. And I think the resistance is even more pronounced in, in, in uh, more emerging economies. And to handle that and develop schemes, that's also where you know, behavioral economics can help and psychology and there's a lot of things we have to learn. And the other thing is, is actually trust in science you know, that we don't abuse the trust in science such that there will be a long, long lasting trust. And you can, if I may say so, there was some not so nice behavior towards minorities in the, uh, some decades ago in certain countries. And that still hurts today. These minorities, they're not willing to take vaccines. Uh, yes. I think it has long lasting effects if you don't uh, treat everybody the same and uh, with mm -hmm. respect. Now, I remember uh, during the time of AIDS, I was working with a famous South African musician, oh. Hugh Masekela. He was very concerned that the prime minister of his country was not using uh, condoms and other forms uh -huh. of uh, insulation from the propagation of AIDS because he thought it was a conspiracy to yeah. stop black African people from continuing to thrive and grow and, and how you say, inhabit the earth. And he thought he had to fight that. And uh, this gentleman that I work with, uh, Masakela, was quite convinced that this was going to be very painful and very harmful. And he devoted a lot of his uh, concert proceeds and so forth to setting up public charity. And uh, so I, I think some of those suspicions, it, it, which you might call are historically well-founded, 
but in the certain innovative contexts, we've got to overcome yes. a lot of that. Now, you talk in your, your presentation that I watched about, about the, nature the nature of a social, social contract. contract. And yeah. in, in, in terms of the structure, structure the, the principles, principles, whatever, what's, what's, a, it, what's, what's a healthy, healthy social, social contract, contract look, look like, like and when can you identify that we don't have one? I mean, then you have to really go into details of all the various policy measures. But I think uh, there has to be uh, ideally some common identity, some caring, some solidarity uh, around the contract. So as I mentioned before, there's two uh, key elements to it. One is uh, you want to mitigate certain form of externalities, really make it understood that this is really not allowed. So that's where you grant freedoms, but also limit them. Essentially, whenever you grant some freedoms, you limit somebody else's freedom not to cause externalities yeah. on you. So that's yeah. essentially the key, one key element. So you limit the externalities from others. And the other element is that you have a certain amount of social security uh, in a sense of granting some insurance scheme uh, for, against in particular idiosyncratic shocks. And that becomes a little mm -hmm. bit more tricky in a sense, you know, ideally, when you look at risks, if you have a more heterogeneous society, a more diverse society, then the shocks are more heterogeneous, they're more diverse, the shocks themselves, and hence you can diversify better. You can actually ensure better if, if the society is more heterogeneous. But we know from Alberto Alessina and others' research, the willingness to do insurance is actually if society is more homogeneous. Mm -hmm. So there is a trade-off mm -hmm. here. On the one hand, the willingness of people to really insure each other is higher if they're more homogeneous. On the other hand, the insurance scheme is actually better if there's more diversity. And we know, in yes. general, more yes. diverse systems are more stable because, you know, and they can help each other much more. And there's a tension between the two. Uh, on the one hand, you know, want a very, very diverse society because shocks are more idiosyncratic and better to ensure. On the other hand, you also want the willingness of people to do it. And of course, this requires some uh, convincing of a heterogeneous society to help each other out and be part and a common identity helps in this uh, phenomenally. And, and that's essentially what's, what's described in the book, these two different dimensions and uh, this tension between diversity and homogeneity. Uh, of the society. Yeah, it resonates in my mind. Uh, my father's family was from Sweden. And yes. looking at macro policies and social welfare design and implementation in Scandinavia is a very different challenge than in the United States. Yes. So it's. But it, also, if we achieve it in America, that diversity might create what I call a cross current of balance different sectors, different regions, different types of people, uh, some contributing to insurance. In different episodes, people collecting the insurance, but the whole system is not going up and down together all the time. That's correct. So it, it's a little bit of a paradox, you know, when <laughs> the, the society is very heterogeneous, very diverse, you can really do a lot in terms of insurance, but they're not willing to do it. If the society is very homogeneous, they're very willing to insure each other, but all the shocks are the same. Everybody's experiencing the same shock, so insurance doesn't work so well. And there's, mm -hmm. there's a paradox uh, which needs to be solved. Uh, essentially, the only solution is to have a more diverse society which, you know, thinks more commonly and is willing to uh, enjoy each other more. But as you used in the outset to this question, the word caring is part of that, uh, how do you say, essential yes. design or... Uh, I, I'm interested into, I'm just trying to improvise around this part of the structure, gun control in the United States. The free, I always think of Isaiah Berlin and the different types of freedom in his writings, but the freedom to carry a gun means your neighbor has to worry about being shot by you. Yes. And that's a loss in their freedom in some respects that they have to be more anxious. But yes, so the freedom to and the freedom from are intention at all times. That's correct. Yes, but I don't it go so deeply in, 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 in this because it doesn't connect to resilience. But I agree with you. That's you know whenever you grant somebody a freedom, you take it away. But there might be a positive sum game because you mm -hmm. give somebody freedoms, you cause an externality, and then the reaction 
to this externality might cause a back, a spillbacks essentially. And then it makes the situation even worse. So everybody will actually benefit from having a tighter regulation or whatever uh, the social contract will prescribe, uh, gun control and other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ultimately everybody, everybody will benefit from that. Yeah, I remember, I think the movie was called Bowling for Columbine by Michael Moore, where he talked about the, the difference between Detroit, where I grew up, mm -hmm. and Windsor and Toronto, which were just across the bridge, places where I went and played hockey, and how much safer they were with a different regime regarding what was legal to carry or have in your home as firearms. Yes. And uh, so I think there, there's a lot of scope for this framework that you're bringing out. And uh, how do I say it? it? I think it applies across yes, it many applies. different domains. Yes. And uh, speed limits in school zones and things like that are also uh, related yes. to these kind of... Uh, so. So this is about the externalities caused by others. If I go back to the insurance aspects, there is, of course, resilience has a slightly different touch to it, uh, which I would like to emphasize too. So insurance in a resilient environment doesn't necessarily mean that if somebody suffers some financial losses, I will immediately compensate it with some money. It might mean that I help him to get out of the hole and he has to do it on his own, and this way he will bounce back. So it's not, you know, blocking the shock in the first place, but just helping to bounce back. So it, it, in a different way, you can say, rather than providing uh, unemployment insurance right away, I give some reskilling. I focus more on the reskilling, and then you can come back. And this gives you more dignity in the long run to be part mm -hmm. of the workforce and part of society. Because we talked about, you know, globalization and hitting Detroit and all this. Just giving transferring money is not often doing, it doesn't give you the same dignity back uh, you had before when you were part of the, you know, producing center and, and producing costs for the rest of the US and the world. Uh, you know, reskilling is probably, uh, if it can be done uh, smartly, is probably more satisfying and, and brings you back in society rather than just getting a, a transfer. So transfer yeah. often is not, the, the, it might be more simple, but it's not uh, the ideal solution. Yeah. You uh, bring up a dilemma also in the presentation that I viewed on innovation and what you call scarring. I can sense when things have been tumultuous, like the pandemic, the presidential election, the January 6th episode, uh, all kinds of fears make people anxious about innovation being disrupted through an, a different channel it's like maybe later guys but not now but so I'm, I'm trying to get at this what is scarring and how do we preserve the possibilities the vitality of innovation in the context of that trade-off yeah so what the book describes it describes this you know, it's a whole chapter devoted on how COVID and other crises stir up and shake up things. Sometimes we're just stuck in certain things, so we can't work from home because it's perceived as being not working hard. And the COVID crisis is really shaking up this social perspective. And that's essentially changing things. Or we have certain arrangements which we, you know, find useful, but now it works. Think of teaching, think of telemedicine, think of many things, think of uh, online conferences. A lot of things will be very different and it was speeding up. It was a trend accelerator. So in this, that's a, you know, any crisis comes with huge changes as well. And many of them can be positive. But then on the other hand, you have the scarring effects, as you mentioned, uh, where the long lasting uh, effects so on directly on the health side, you have long COVID, you have psychological implications for many people, and you have uh, breakups from uh, job uh, losses where firms and workers are broken up and they don't find together again. So you have a higher unemployment rate and even sexual unemployment rate potentially. And so this leads to long lasting scarring effects. And these one has to mitigate. Uh, because they are essentially scarring effects, they are anti-resilience. So they don't allow them to, to bounce back. It's actually when you scarred and because of the scarring, be it long COVID, be it anything, you, you don't come back. Uh, 
and that's one thing one has to really look out for and uh, help out in order to make sure not there's no way to protect from the initial impact of the shock so you can mitigate this too but if you have such a shock help out to make sure that people can bounce back mm -hmm. and i guess the initial conditions when anything is what we call a disruption uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about West Virginia and climate change. We're, INET's running a series of panels on just transition and a transition to justice uh, with relation to climate change. There is a, a huge fear in this country that with very highly concentrated wealth, whatever we go through, a handful of people, we'll just call it the 1%, will be able to insulate themselves. They have the resources, the power, the means, and, uh, and that everybody else will be damaged. How does, which you might call the courage to innovate, relate to the breadth of wealth and income distribution? So that, how do I say, more of us are on the side of innovation unless we say hunker down in our garage trying to avoid breakage i think we you need that everybody has a certain equal opportunity to innovate so having low entry costs to innovate i think is very, very important that you can mm -hmm. have startups mm -hmm. and you have with new technology actually some of the entry barriers actually are much lower and some are much higher so if you want to set up a certain company and you can all the IT system and all this much more easier to set up um, than it was uh, decades or two decades ago. On the other hand, there are some new network externalities where the entry cost increased significantly. So that's, you know, it, it's shifting and you have this winner takes it all societies uh, where, you know, only a few uh, will get the huge payoffs and the others who don't make it, who just are second, third or fourth placed, uh, don't get it. So that's something you have to keep in mind in innovation. So in the book I talk about in one chapter about uh, inequality and uh, social challenges, in particular the inequalities, and you know it's very important to distinguish between income inequality, wealth inequality, and what I talk is about resilience inequality. So that's essentially for some people they are poor in resilience because they can't bounce back. And if other people they are very easy for them to bounce back. And once you have this, this interacts with income and wealth inequality, because if I know I can easily bounce back because I have some support system or something, I can take on more risk. And then mm -hmm. I get higher returns from going more for more risky projects. I become more wealthy down the road. And this way, having this resilience inequality is interacting with wealth and income inequality in a sophisticated way. But if you have more resilience, that allows you to give more, take on more risk, and then subsequently become you become more wealthy down the road, and it feeds into wealth inequality. So we have to make sure that all people have roughly the same resilience inequality, and are not resilience poor, because that's what you want to grant them initially, and then that can take the opportunities. And many people can't take the opportunities, because they are really afraid uh, that once the phaser shock they can't come back and that's you know in many developing economies that's the case that you, you you're a farmer and suddenly you can't you have a bad crop this year and you can't send your kids anymore to school and um and that not only hurts yourself you can't bounce back but even your kids they can't can bounce back and be part of uh of the flourishing society and that's uh, i think where the resilience interacts very dramatically and importantly with other inequality measures you know, well, you know uh, our research director at INET, Tom Ferguson, who looks at the feedback of wealth concentration onto the design and enforcement implementation of social policy and how that, uh, which you might call, uh, that system, which promotes excessively, perhaps, policies for the few, is quite dangerous in many people's mind now because the many despair and they become subject, if you will, attracted to authoritarian rule. 
Yeah. That when they don't think the democracy works right, I know Martin Wolf is writing a book about this at, at the Financial yeah. Times right now. When they don't think the system is protective of all of us, they start looking for someone, in this case, Donald Trump, who say the system is rigged. We got to change it. And they say, oh, I haven't heard that in a long time. Both parties were playing with the narrow. So I think there's a lot about what you might call the interaction between politics and economics that has to do with the design and implementation of a resilient system, which then fosters more innovation, less fear, and less susceptibility to authoritarian rule. So I think, I think you're, you're really playing in, how would I say, you're, you're exploring very important dimensions of the quality of life in this, in this realm. Yeah, I, I agree that this is an important point. So for me, you know, your wealth inequality it depends very much what the wealthy do with their wealth. You know, if, mm -hmm. if somebody is very wealthy, but he invests it and puts a re pushes really the frontier and that has positive spillover effects to the rest of society, so be it. If he is a very good decision maker and is mm -hmm. innovating and, you know, develops new industries or pushes whole industries forward and then this has benefits to uh, to most of us but then it's fine if he's just uh, you know spending it on on luxury goods and it's not really beneficial for the rest of society then it's a totally different mm -hmm. thing so we might want yeah, to consider yeah. you know discriminating between the two things uh, so which yeah. one benefit and which, what activities don't benefit and uh, treat it you know from a tax perspective accordingly yeah. Well, there's a gentleman that I know quite well named Morris Pearl, who leads a group called the Patriotic Millionaires. And their thought is, how do you redirect this money? And you, you mentioned luxury goods, but his big concern is they use that money in lobbying to take what used to be called tax evasion and turn it into tax avoidance. And then state and local governments can say, we can't afford it because we don't have the budget anymore because large concentrations of wealth are kept offshore and not considered accessible for rebuilding the infrastructure, and in, particularly in a period of transition. But okay. uh, so I think you've got a lot of, uh, I would say a lot of dimensions to this, but that I love what you said, that there are people with money who are brilliant, who are doing good as well as doing well. Don't throw that baby out with the bathwater. Yes because that puts us into a stagnant place and, and, per, and in the world of climate change, perhaps a much more dangerous place. Yes, yeah, so I think we need, so in a sense, we need an open-minded system where mavericks can also thrive. So sometimes it is some maverick who is really innovating a huge thing uh, and then helps us to overcome, let's say, climate change or mm -hmm. is coming mm -hmm. and pushing certain technologies much more efficiently than many others could do. And that's, I think, the big advantage of um, a democratic open society where it allows for people to think differently and is open to it. And if you have an autocratic society, it's a little bit more like the oak. You know, it's very rigid. It's not moving. It seems very stable. But when the wind is too strong, it will fall, while a democracy might look much more like the reed. And mm -hmm. it allows for constant debate and back and forth and... And it seems less stable, but ultimately, I think the transition of power is smooth and it actually makes the whole uh, society much, much more uh, a stable uh, framework to live in. And mm -hmm. I think what's really important is that people who think differently should be allowed to think, should be allowed to explore things and uh, push the frontier, essentially. And, um, and that's what you can see in, in, in the US and in other societies. Who allow for that so you know going new directions and helping this way the whole society and one has to acknowledge that and if somebody's very wealthy because of that and he's still pushing the frontier so be it don't stop him that's my uh, philosophy if somebody's not doing things which you know will help uh, and is taking risks is not taking risks so somebody who's taking risk and this and do it does a lot of r d and that's i think it will ultimately benefit uh, everybody. Yeah. There's a, a group that affiliates with INET quite closely, the Center for International Governance Innovation in, in Canada, in the suburbs of Toronto. 
and uh, Rohit Madora, who's their CEO and part of the INET board, and Jim Balsilli, who's the founder, have often talked to me about feeling that in the realm of technology, we need something akin to the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. In other words, where we don't let it unbridled go and affect society, we run tests and we assess its social goodness relative to the, which you might call power of private accumulation. And their, their thought is that having a system like that, that has credibility and expertise, and those are necessary conditions, may improve the confidence of society as a whole and diminish the resistance to tolerating innovation because it's it's filtered by a vision of social what you might call accountability social good and uh, this is what they do in the far with the pharmaceutical drugs to yeah the only to, problem is what is good and what is bad there might be huge that's disagreement that's no, right. and if there's one that's committee right. deciding what's good or bad that's a little bit yeah. You know, you might go the wrong direction because the committee decided the wrong way. So I like yeah. it more pluralistic that everybody can, you know, push for things. If it's really bad, like for drugs, you have to be really careful because, you know, once you die, there's no bounce back from that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no resilience. Yeah. So for this, you need the FDA and Food and Drug Administration and things. But if somebody wants to just experiment with a new way of setting up companies or doing mm -hmm. uh, things differently or go to Mars or things like that, um, then I would be more open-minded. I would allow people's freedom to uh, select that as long as the risk, and in particular the non-bouncing back risks, so this uh, where you fall into a tipping point or some um, trap and all this. So that these are the risks you know one has to look out for. If people want to take different risks and potentially discover accidentally something, um, I think that's good. If you just have one committee deciding about all the risk taking, that might be too interventionistic yep. in a sense. Well, and to go back to Tom Ferguson's notion of capture, yes. people know how to protect their intellectual yes. property rights. So people who are making a profit see a new innovation that may make mankind better off but displace them. Can, perhaps influence these committees and exactly. stifle an innovation that would benefit us all. Yeah, there so would be it's, huge, it's the, for this committee, there will be huge lobbying efforts. To get the, <laughs> yes. So yes. that will be then, uh, you know, at the end of the day, everybody will try to lobby this committee. Uh, yeah. But if I, if I come back to the vaccines, we have developed uh, the mRNA vaccines and other vaccines. If you think about it, of course, as you mentioned, they cost billions and the companies will make billions of dollars, but the benefits to human mankind are in the trillions and even more so. So there are still huge spillovers from innovations more generally. And I think one has to uh, uh, take these innovations fully into account and promote it. So yes, yes. putting this in the bigger picture, there's too little innovation uh, because, uh, uh, because of the benefits, given the benefits which accrue to everybody, we should actually innovate more and Push it from tier more. Mm -hmm. well, let's, let's uh, uh, how you say, leave the frontier of Schumpeter and go back to where you and I met, which is the question of resilience and the operation of the financial system. You mentioned earlier the great financial crisis and now the pandemic, but how did talk talk to me about the resilience of a financial society and what role central banks play? What role does regulation play in that sector? Yeah, so for central banks are very crucial for resilience. So essentially, whenever there's a liquidity run or some run in the system, central banks can make a, a very big difference. And you could see it in March 2020, where, you know, the whole global financial system was about to implode. So nobody wanted to hold even U.S. treasuries. Mm -hmm. And then the Fed stepped in, cut the interest rate and really stabilized all capital flows at the global scale. So without this intervention, there were huge outflows, much bigger outflows than in the taper tantrum or the global financial crisis. So the emerging economies would have been collapsed without the intervention of the Fed in March 2020. Mm -hmm. So this was really crucial uh, to stabilize the global financial system. But more generally, I mean, the Fed, you know, used the same playbook they used for the global financial crisis and were stabilizing this. But what one has to 
take into account that there might be, you know, you, you buy some resilience at the, at the very immediate front in order to stop that, but you might build up some other risks for the long run. So it might make the system less resilient in the very long run. And then has, it's a del delicate balancing act to really keep this uh, term structure of resilience in a sense mm -hmm. um, in, in check. And that's, you know, something one has to keep in mind uh, as well as one intervenes where it might hurt resilience in the long run. But more generally, uh, financial resilience, you could say one way to get more resilience is to have more buffers, having more equity requirements. And that's a little mm -hmm. bit like a robustness approach. So once mm -hmm. the equity is gone, you have to break. So what you also need is you need some good debt restructuring mechanism. So when the buffer is used up, what do you do then? And then you restructure debt. And if you can do this restructuring in a way which does not cause huge spillovers or does not cause huge bankruptcy costs. So if you have a very well-oiled uh, bank uh, bankruptcy procedure or debt restructuring procedure, but this way you create much more resilience to the society. And you know, mm -hmm. that's on the domestic side. Uh, also, if somebody is overly indebted, he has, can get rid of its debt or can come back and grow out of his hole. But it also means for sovereign debt. So you would like to have some uh, debt restructuring possibilities, which are not too costly if a country is overly indebted, that they can actually you know, grow out of its debt and you don't want to be suffering from debt overhang problems, which will be tremendously costly for the growth rate of an individual, but also for a whole country. And that's part of the resilience. So debt restructuring, efficient debt restructuring, which makes it less costly, uh, would be is a big component of uh, financial resilience. Yeah, well, I think particularly now in a world where, if you will, some of the downturns that occurred since 2020 were not caused by errors in policy in the global south, but they experienced the slowdown. And now we're coming out of that. Their debt has run up to cope with those circumstances. And we're asking them to embrace climate change as part of a global partnership. How do we handle what you might call the risk premium with sovereign debt overhangs and the need at the margin in many places in Africa, India, or Global South to contribute to the, how would say, transformation of the energy structure? Yeah, so the two things. So as you pointed rightly out, so the Global South was suffering from the COVID crisis much more from the global financial crisis, actually, the advanced economies were suffering more than, and the That's emerging right. economies actually That's did right. fairly well. They handled this uh, fairly well. So it is now the other way around this time. So it's not clear when it goes this way, when it goes the other way. But with respect to a climate change, I think my view is we have to take some certain R&D risks. So we have to develop new technologies. And it is the task of the advanced economies to develop these technologies and show a model or provide a role model how to transition with these new technologies to a more environmentally friendly world. And then we can approach to, uh, once the technology is out there, we can approach the emerging economy and say, okay, there is a, is a way. I don't want you that you don't have any heating in India or somewhere where you live and you know, you're freezing anyway. So you, it's very hard to argue you can't burn your coal because uh, we, we have a global climate change and uh, you're suffering from the basics, what we consider as basics in the advanced economies. So the, the way, the, the duty for the advanced economies is to develop some technologies which make it much more environmentally friendly to get the services we just enjoy. Uh, and we can't tell them not to enjoy the same things we are enjoying. Yes, yes. yes. Well, Marcus, I don't know uh... If you have other chapters or other thoughts you'd like to share with the audience, are there are there other issues that you'd like to excavate? I think uh, we covered it pretty much. I just want to say at the end, you know, of the book, I go a little bit. So the book is very much focused. What can we learn from the COVID crisis for other shocks? Mm -hmm. And of course, pandemic shocks is one particular shock. But then you can imagine many, many different shocks as well. So it could be cyber attacks. We will yes. have a lot of changes coming up 
on the technology side, we will probably produce in labs some organs where you can transplant organs much more easily. It will be huge advancements, but there might be certain things which go wrong. So we have to be ready for these shocks. And you cannot think of all the shocks which might happen. So we have to be able to be flexible enough so that we can actually adjust and modify our behavior accordingly. And I think this is flexibility that gives us a resilience. And uh, you know, many, many potential shocks we might be facing in the near future. And we should be confident that we have everything in place uh, in order to react to that. And one good example is like the global value chains where we have seen, you know, all the supply chains, everything is now going in difficulties. And the answer is probably not to just say we reshore everything, we do everything in the US, because this will hurt emerging economies tremendously and they will suffer from that. Uh, it's probably saying we might multi-source, we provide it from, and we, we flexibly can then switch from one country to another country if there's some you know, outbreak of some health crisis or something, we can still source from another country. Uh, and, and certain things will bring back and do some reshoring, but many things we can be more resilient and have a global vision and, and work together. And the final point I wanted to make, so the COVID crisis was a big global crisis and we didn't react really as a global society. So a lot of nationalistic aspects came back. And that's, you know, in order to have a resilient society, we really have to work together also for global challenges at a global scale. And there's a lot of institutional buildings necessary in order to have this framework to react at a global scale efficiently.